All right. All right, so obviously the title was Gut Microbiome Composition, a Link Between Sports Performance and Protein Absorption by Fritz et al. 2024. I think they were in uh, German, Germany, uh, Essen or something like that. I didn't actually know or look where exactly. But anyway, um, so the reason for the study was their following chain of thought or train of thought, however you would like to say. Um, so basically saying performance is very much affected by how much and what we eat, especially protein. Then they thought protein requirements for athletes in general can be a lot to digest. So because we need more, it's difficult to break down often, and that can lead to inflammation and therefore um, ironically potentially reducing performance and well-being. Oftentimes supplementation, for example, whey may help with that digestibility, but how about plant-based sources that tend to be quote unquote tougher um, and can pre or probiotics help? So because of all these thoughts, they came up with this current, current study where they conducted a 31 day observational period to examine how a short-term diet of plant-based vegan protein affected muscle development in elite water polo players. One group of players received protein um, plus a plus prebiotics and fermented probiotics, um, in addition to just the um, protein supplement, um, and they that then they would want to see if that would decrease the inflammation and therefore aid in performance. So what they basically did again was um they had ten athletes per group. All of them received a vegan protein blend 30 minutes after the first training and 30 minutes before lunch. The intervention group, as mentioned, also received 3.5 grams of prebiotics with the shake and a probiotic solution that was required to be chilled immediately after waking up. Um, so essentially, this is uh, the graphic for the whole study design where um, three days before um, the intervention period. Um, they did a Bristol stool analysis and they analyzed their nutritional habits. They analyzed their gut microbiome. They analyzed their body composition by way of in-body. Um, and we'll talk about the specifics here in a minute. And then they also did a, a routine blood analysis. Um, so that was the same for both groups. And then throughout the intervention period, so the 31 days, um, as mentioned, there the only difference was the prebiotics and the probiotics. And then again, they basically conducted the same thing, same same analyses, um, on on three days following this intervention period, and they took another um, body composition analysis and another blood analysis. So what they basically found was that total daily energy was similar between groups. Um, and in the pre and post testing, so no differences in macronutrient and fiber intake was observed in either. Um, nonetheless, at the end of the study, players in the intervention group had a significant change in stool composition, potentially because of the probiotics and prebiotics compared to the control, but both were in healthy ranges. I just um, intersected or put in that Bristol stool chart here for anyone who hasn't seen that. I find that quite, quite um, helpful with clients sometimes as well. Um, if someone's saying my, my, my stool is off. Uh, I don't know, Tom, if you guys use that as well for with patients. Yes. Nice. Um, further more to the findings. So when it comes to the gut microbiome, Again, that was assessed via stool sample, um, and they mentioned that the alpha diversity did not change significantly. Several markers changed significantly in both groups, such as the blah, blah, blah ratio, a commonly used indicator of gut balance, um, and others significantly decreased. Um, so what I personally, and I'm going to throw that in here already, what I always find so hard with anything gut microbiome is that essentially um, we know 
excuse me, we know so little about the bacteria strains in general and which are good or which are bad or like in general, oftentimes people just say like, oh, there was a change. Well, was it for good? Was it for bad? Was there a, like when they're like, oh, there was a gut dysbiosis of this and that. And like, for example, with many of the studies that pertained to artificial sweeteners just recently, um, I, I think it's always so helpful to just keep in mind, like just because they say there's a dysbiosis, it doesn't mean that it, that change was necessarily for the for the worse per se there was just some change and change can happen from many many things so um yeah i think as as tom kind of said earlier too like i think some of the things that they wrote about in the conclusion or their findings or so they just wrote in a way where they wanted to you to 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 read it in a certain way without actually like throwing in as as many confusing terms as possible so that in the end you're just like oh okay blah, 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 blah. I'm skipping to the most important word changed for the better cool <laughs> so you know even though it might have simply just been oh there was a, dif a difference in this and that so um yeah I always find that super duper difficult with gut microbiome um any anything research really because most most of us don't know which of these strains are good or bad um but yeah. Lisa, I, I don't really think anyone knows if they're good or bad. It really exactly. depends on the context, on the quantity, how many, with whom are they living, where in your intestine they are. And I think not even they can say it. And the variability, the highest variability is between individuals, not between treatments. And they have so exactly. few subjects that there is no way that with 10 subjects, you can say that this change was for good or for bad in general we are not there yet no exactly that that's exactly what i'm saying and i i think to tom's point that they just wrote it in a way where it sounds like it's then something positive but i totally agree with you i don't think that that you can you can just like the th the thing that they could have just said was like there were there were changes full stop <laughs> Like you can't just say you know there they were changes. they wanted some they degree. wanted more words yeah yeah. Um, but yeah, continuing on with the findings. So when it comes to the body composition and anthropometics, um, so in the beginning, there were no significant differences in anthropometics and body composition between groups. Um, but at the end, body weight went up in both groups. However, they're stating that in the intervention group, there was more increase through lean tissue um, which they're basically, again, basing on the in-body scan, scan. And I'll tell a little story about this um, shortly too. Um, and the arm mass increased significantly. So therefore they're concluding, you know, body fat um, or from the in-body body fat reduced significantly in this group. And um, however, in the control group, it was the other way around and um, an elevated body fat mass was detected in comparison to the pre-testing. So like in body, I actually have quite a bit of experience with um, because the gym that I went to in Colombia, they have an in body machine and it's free. So I like literally um, for a few weeks, I went every single day on it. And it was often like the body fat percentage was often two, three percent different from one day to another because I might have had more water. Um, I might have just had more fiber. Maybe even like I, I forgot to, my hands were colder, whatever. So I'm a firm disbeliever in the freaking in body scan. <laughs> so I don't know, like this is probably my biggest criticism about this whole entire study is just like, why in the world would you want to use an in body? I mean, yes, obviously it's cheaper than a DEXA and maybe more practical. Um, but it's just, it's not, a di and it doesn't say anything if, in my opinion, really, it, it might've just said like they, they didn't even, they, they did mention, ah, oh, they, the body in body scan was performed according to the manufacturer's instructions of like not exercising for three hours beforehand and blah, blah, but it didn't state anything about time of day. It didn't like, yeah, for me, it was just a completely useless way of measuring body composition. And then that being the th one thing that you're really basing almost all your findings on. Um, yeah, in my opinion, that should be something that is reasonably accurate. But yeah, Melissa, you, I quote unquote, crit criticized the in body as well, right? When, when you messaged me. 
if yeah. the problem was caused, they also could have used calipers. Yeah. Because I understand, yeah. I mean, I don't have access to Adexa. It doesn't matter that I would like to pay for it. I cannot have it. It's not available here. But you could have skin someone using skin calipers that should be available. Yeah, no, I to totally agree. Or then, you know, use something different as your measure of success or not success like because this is the the whole paper is titled blah 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 something in performance and none of the measures that they used here are even remotely closely related to their performance at all so like it doesn't make sense <laughs> to thomas point like put on a cool title but then actually when you read through it it's like okay cool their lean are their arm mass increased but what does that like it doesn't necessarily mean that it helps a wa water polo player does he yeah, actually now? someone explained to me why did they gain weight because i don't get it yeah why? yeah no i uh, because because again also they are saying in the uh, previous slide or some other slide and um, no macronutrient differences um between the groups or pre and post testing either so obviously they according to this they didn't need in a calorie surplus although like how are they how did they assess it they just talked well, to they it. didn't say it was difference between the beginning at the end but then that means that both groups were eating in a surplus from the beginning yeah yeah or, or like did they eat this exact same thing <clears throat> plus the shake or like... the way in if it's okay pardon um I'd love to weigh in on this because I, I think yes. they've been more liberately, um, they, they've sort of obst, obst, been obstinate. No, they've covered what they did, basically. They haven't been obvious with what they did. But if you go through, I, I, and I don't want to go heavy on the stats, but just, just very briefly, if you go to, um, if you ever, if anyone fancies it, you can go to table one, you can look at the, the measurements and stuff. Numerically, if you were just looking at it numerically, it's not interesting. There's no difference. It's not interesting at all. There's a tiny bit of, the, the, you know, when they talked about fat-free mass, yeah, fine. The intervention group put on a bit more compared to the control group, but it's not really interesting. And clinically, you wouldn't say it's interesting. Moreover, so they used statistical tests. So they used, um, so they used paired and unpaired t-tests, right? So you use that on parametric data, parametric meaning that uh, if you were to look at a population, uh, the data would be spread out uh, in a parametric way. So you'd have a, a mean, and then it's like a bell-shaped, right? A bell-shaped curve. So um, so that's what they used. And you can use paired and unpaired to compare the difference with an intervention uh, in one group um, at the start and at the end. So that's the paired. Um, and that's the first p-value that you see. It's the first column. And it's all, all pretty much statistic, statistically significant, meaning the changes that you saw in each group are significant. So the intervention at the start and the end, there was a significant change. But then they used an unpaired t-test to compare the intervention to the control at the start and the end. And they are nowhere near statistically significant, nowhere near, not even close. You, you couldn't even like suggest that they thought perhaps no they just completely balls it up made it up i don't know but it's just a load of shite basically <sighs> there is no difference between the groups end of story <laughs> awesome well thank you for laying that out for us and 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 why and um yeah kind of shocking that they can still put it in a way that hey yes um there was a difference um yeah. that's interesting I, to know as in why yeah and in fairness i'm not a, stati a statistician so if anyone you know thinks ah no 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 tom you're chatting shit then let me let me know but from my understanding of, of, of stats and things yeah they, they there's no difference and again uh and i'm sure you guys can comment on this as well unfortunately in publications this is what authors do mm. they just they just twist it just a little bit they just love it because they did actually leave out that there isn't they didn't say a statistically significant difference they just said there's a difference oh. so that, that's what they do Sneaky. It's annoying. <laughs> oh, very annoying because i mean I, I do wish there were more studies where the result was literally just there was no there is no difference between x and 
why because uh, like I mean you cannot publish that they don't allow you to publish that so if you send that to a magazine you will be rejected right yeah well that's the sad thing I guess but yeah yep. so all negative results are not published mm. if you if you did an experiment that did not work you cannot publish it so people has to fail again and find out that this way doesn't work because what doesn't work doesn't get published mm. sad but yeah they did the uh, just to throw in that quote there um uh, the players who were divided into the control and intervention groups received the same diet and had the same training program during the study period thus the difference between the two groups was the additional intake of pre and pro probiotics so yeah nicely phrased and framed um but anyway <laughs> so much for that so their conclusion was Vegan protein supplementation improved body weight in 19 players, but skeletal muscle mass increased significantly only in the intervention group. We hypothesize that due to the additional intake of prebiotics and probiotics, fermentation of the gut microbiome was more efficient in the intervention group, which may have contributed to skeletal muscle development. So, yes, basically... <laughs> so they gave a bunch of people some more protein in a previous study they showed that these people don't eat enough protein and lo and behold they put on weight and they gain muscle oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> come on guys uh well the interesting thing if it's okay again um because i went on a deep dive on this because i find it really interesting um they they um cited uh, a study as uh, by pro Copidis, the one that was retracted. Is it uh, is it retracted? I don't think so. Reference seven or eight. Reference twenty two is retracted. No, no, not twenty two. And the eight, it doesn't say what they say it says. Ah. So they say it uh, the excess protein causes inflammation, and once you go to the reference, the reference says that lack of protein causes inflammation. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure it's either reference seven or eight, and again, it's it's around proteins, and they say it, they they have referenced it, saying that excess protein might be pro-inflammatory. Um, this this uh, paper is still definitely published, and it's it's a really nice uh, review paper actually. That uh, about inflammatory oh. colitis, something like this. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's reference eight. I didn't bother reading it because I just I was like, okay, the, the, basically this this paper. Which reference eight says actually protein might help you to prevent inflammatory bile, which is the opposite of what they said in this paper. Anyway, but yeah, reference seven, it's really good, really well worth looking at. Um, but they talked about that ratio that you mentioned, Lisa. Um, so the FB ratio. Um, that, you said you know I'd like what the hell is that? But uh, which is the firmicutes and the bacterioides or something? The phylum, the phylum. Yeah. Um, Firmicutes and bacterioids. Yeah, that's that's it. So um, from what I understand, and again, someone else can correct me, um, it's a, a sort of very early marker that they're using as a marker of dysbiosis. So if the ratio goes too high or too low, then you might have dysbiosis um, because they form 90% of the bacteria that you find in the gut, the human flora anyway. Um, and uh, I think, again, from what they've said, it seems like as you age, you get more of the F1, whatever that was again, <laughs> the firmicutes. Um, uh, but anyway, um, essentially, if you have too many firmicutes, that's linked with obesity, type 2 diabetes, etc. cetera. Um, and they think that, therefore, that if the ratio goes down, so you have more bacterioides, that that's a good thing. And they said in this paper that they found in both groups, that the bacterioides went up significantly, which is probably because of the protein intake. So they actually support protein intake in this paper. They it's just didn't say. Not necessarily the probiotics or prebiotics, um, I guess. Well, when that's it's... what's interesting, right? Because the in the control group didn't get that, and yet they had a bigger increase in the bacterioides group. And they have a, a greater decrease in the ratio. So they got is... a better ratio. The control group, what got to, to, to summarize it, what Tom is saying is that the control group got a better FB ratio than the intervention group. 
Without so it. they are saying that the ratio improved in both groups. It is true, but it improved more in the control group than in the intervention group. So what you're saying is that your intervention made it worse, improve less, not get worse, but it yeah. improved less with the intervention and it improved more in the control group, which would mean that the fiber and the probiotic actually made it worse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it just uh, it very doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm like I'm literally just shocked that they're able to publish that and that no one like before publishing it though that no one reads over it and is like pointing out that bullshit that you guys are basically noticing. I don't know how they got it, but I mean, if you can publish that with your hotmail uh, email, yeah, maybe your university doesn't know that you're publishing that. Did you check the email from the author, the corresponding email? You point you pointed it out, yeah, that it was something something Gmail or hotmail. Hotmail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not even. Don't but... send it to my official email of the university. They don't know that I'm publishing this shit. Literally speaking. <laughs> That's pretty funny, and pretty pretty funny, pretty sad, and almost shocking for the University of Essen or whatever it is. But anyway. <laughs> Um, it it was the it was most of the researchers are from an Hungarian uh, university. The one from the SN University is just one of them, and the players were from Hungary. Yeah. So I, I would guess sure. that most of the study and data came from Hungary, and it was done in there. And the one from SN was probably just a collaborator, or yeah. maybe the head of the lab, or something like this, or they did some analysis for them. Maybe that's the lab that actually did the metagenomics and therefore there is a name in there, but they might not be even aware of the rest of the stuff that went into the paper. Sure. All right. Um, yeah. So I do have, I, I already noted um, like my, um, my issues with the paper here before. I do have a few questions like just to throw out here in the in, in this round and um, what which I'm curious about for you guys personally or with clients. Um so like when it comes to protein bloat, just having, you know, if you've eaten twice as much protein that you usually eat, um, or specific protein sources, have you has anyone felt a particular protein bloat before? Yes. It feels like you ate a brick. <laughs> it it does. I mean, I've been to like a few Brazilian barbecues where it's all you can eat. And I, I probably consumed 250 grams of protein, which is probably about double of what I normally eat. And it was definitely like, <laughs> the next Is that day, because of the protein though or because of the huge volume of food no because i mean i still control my calories for the most part like it wouldn't have been if, if anything it would have maybe been two three hundred calories more than what i normally eat so not because but maybe just because it's different things than what i usually eat, eat but um i i certainly have experienced protein bloat before and um, or at least it's also something that um, I hear often when people start off with a higher protein diet and they come from, you know, 40, 50 grams a day, and then you're telling them to eat 150. And they're like, oh, I feel so bloated. I fart all the time. Um, <laughs> I I hear hear that all, all, all very regularly when people start off with a higher protein diet. I don't know if you guys have experienced that with clients or patients. If I might, again, just from one of the papers I was reading, uh, they were talking about um, roughly like 10% of the protein that you eat gets to the large uh, intestine um, undigested. And um, they were saying that even if you increase your protein, and I don't know if they, this is something that's just acute or if it's long-term, but even if you increase your protein, that that will increase as well. So the more protein will get to the colon. Um, but I do wonder if after time, because we do know that if you eat a specific pattern of foods then you'll get a change in your digestive enzymes so you might get upregulation like so maybe that's why oh you definitely know. i would i would say so yeah i usually try to get those clients to like increase in increments so maybe from like 50 to 80 for a couple of weeks from 80 to 110 and then 100 and 140 from there and usually the digestive tract does does keep up with that um yeah, and what about uh, experiences with bloat from too much fiber? 
Have, has anyone had that? Not necessarily constipation, but just re feeling really bloated. Any particular foods? For sure. Being a vegetarian, my protein sources tend to be higher in fiber. So you eat a lot of black beans. You're not going to feel awesome. That's all I'm going to say about that. Or too many chia seeds. It's going to be a rough later in the day. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Legumes. I, I, I can't do legumes. It's just uncomfortable. So yeah definitely i think with legumes it's more than anything when it comes to those it's quantity that really matters like i'm absolutely fine with any kind of legumes as long as it's like 50 60 type of grams but give me like a lentil stew and you're like oh yeah i i made the um mistake so to speak i i think uh i don't even know it was like 2018 or 2019 but i was just wanting to prove to some people that i could do like a vegan or could hit my my protein um on a vegan diet and i was very going about it in a very stupid way so basically from one day to another i wanted um i just wanted to hit only with um plant based sources and i didn't pay attention to fiber at the time but like in hindsight i probably doubled my fiber so um i was constipated for like a week i'm not even joking <laughs> like it was so uncomfortable i just thought i can i can obviously hit my protein target with this but i cannot go to the bathroom anymore <laughs> it was not fun <laughs> That sounds awful. I think it's really important on the back of that is, um, you know, obviously when we need to eat more fiber, we also need to eat or drink more water and protein is the same. Like the metabolism of protein in the body requires water and the more protein you eat, the more water you use. So, um, both of those things together, if you're eating vegan protein and you're not changing the amount of water that you're drinking, it's the recipe for disaster. hundred percent. Yeah. Or at least, yeah, playing with it slowly. Um, yes. yeah, the other, the other thing I wanted to to touch on is just like probiotic supplementation, which I mean, obviously, this is kind of based on and promoting. Um, but I do see a lot of uh, nutrition coaches uh, just blank this is, um, recommending a probiotic supplement, and I have a big problem with this because. Um, I mean, again, we don't really know what sort of strains someone has, what sort of strains someone is missing, what, uh, like, even if you, if they do supplement with those probiotics and then they don't consume enough fiber, we're not technically feeding those probiotics. So I just think the majority of the cases, it's kind of like money down the drain. And also particularly with the probiotic supplements that many people buy, they might not have enough of the cultures um, or it's just like, over the counter is something that doesn't need to be chilled. And, and I mean, that's kind of a red flag in and of itself, but yeah, what are your guys' thoughts um, or what do you hear practices when it comes to probiotics? I agree with you, everything you said. And I think that even the good ones, the quote unquote, good supplements may not survive the digestive process. And so you're not really doing anything. You're just spending money on nothing. And I think a better approach is like what you're saying about like feeding the prebiotics, like giving your body prebiotics, a variety of different fibers, then you're feeding the different, um, flora and fauna in there, um, the food that they like basically. So you're growing them in the way that they naturally grow. Yeah. I yeah. I think, think Alison it... and Lisa are just saying that is exactly everything that I wanted to say. I just wanted to add to that, that, um, Silvana, which is a, a good friend of mine, Lisa sort of kind of knows uh, she's also a microbiologist and she works in um, microbiology and in uh, genomics of the microbiome and she's also shocked on how many people just buy uh, probiotics over the counter like in the supermarket you can buy anything and it does nothing it does absolutely nothing there are some cases where you can get a prescription and they need to be called and those ones Alison have been formulated on a way that it can get through the digestive system but it is like a medical grade and they are uh, prescribed for certain conditions that's what she explained me but it is like your doctor prescribes you this and then you take it but you cannot just get and drink a cocktail of bacteria that you don't know if those are the ones you actually need. 
you don't know if you are getting the quantity that you need and you don't know how they will interact with the ones that you already have. So totally agree with Alison, just feed them different kinds of fiber. And there you go. Even when you take antibiotics, and uh, I was prescribed that in the hospital in here in Germany. Okay, after the antibiotic treatment that you had, because it was a uh, very wide spectrum antibiotics, you need to take some probiotics. And I say, uh huh, mm -hmm. mm. yes, sure. Um, no, I'm not gonna buy them. They cannot they didn't prescribe, prescribe them. any. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they cannot because the the social security system doesn't cover them. Right. <laughs> but she said I should buy them by myself from my pocket. Okay. Know? So then I didn't do. I, I ate what I normally eat. I ate a diversity of fibers. I ate fermented foods, if that is possible. And that will repopulate my gut soon enough. Yeah, I, I think the, the tough thing that we have is that in many cultures nowadays, Unfortunately, it's not so common to eat fermented foods or people almost think it's gross. Like if if we think of Korean or Japanese culture, so they're they're so great with their like, you know, kimchi that's that is something that they eat on a regular basis or natto or whatever is so, so, so common. Like, I mean, in, in Germany, the most common thing is sauerkraut, but even that is off the shelf. It's not chilled. So it doesn't have any live bacteria. It doesn't do anything for actually populating the gut. Um, but yeah, Tom, I'm curious if you guys, um, if like w w with probiotics, is that something that you guys prescribe ever? No. No, don't do it. We haven't, um, we just haven't got the evidence for it. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I think the, you know, the key thing with it really is, yeah, if you just eat fiber, <laughs> you'll be fine. Yeah. Like my patients who that I, that I give antibiotics to, especially, um, broad spectrum antibiotics where they'll be at risk of um uh, something called c diff um c diff is is clostridium you find it in most people's guts so it's but when you hit someone with antibiotics it just gives it a chance to grow uh, basically um but it's just a bit nasty it can give you really nasty diarrhea bloody diarrhea can make some people really ill um all of them i just say to them honestly just get back to eating your normal pattern and if it's a pattern that's really low in fiber you got to do something about that now yeah. you know don't go crazy but start just trying to trickle it in now 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 and if you really want go get some yakult or something because it's just got lactobacillus and, and yeah that's right else. like you know. your stuff. yeah but yeah any other thoughts on probiotics prebiotics yeah i think um i have to say i i um yeah, I had a lot of issues with it and uh, went a lot to the doctors and they they always said like it wouldn't even make sense to start with a probiotic straight away or something like that. It, it first makes sense to repair the Darmschleimhaut. Yeah, the gut lining. So the gut lining, so they have some pro you start with that and if the gut lining, if you're for example leaky gut, which most of the women like from homo, ho, hormone um, imbalance or um, yeah I don't know like other other food yeah how to say but but that would be the first thing otherwise you kind of it's it's for the bin like yeah, yeah it would make sense to feed the gut with good bacteria if everything kind of goes away anyway so mm -hmm. maybe Lisa can explain it a little bit better <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I th think that was under uh, understandable. And I, I agree. I'm surprised and actually pleasantly surprised that they said it to you in that way, because um, as uh, Melissa said, I think that that old school approach of just like, oh, just go and buy your own probiotic um, is much more common where they actually don't have a, a clue. Um, but restoring the gut lining with like glutamine or other things um, would definitely be, um, in my opinion, also a better approach. And it's uh, I have to say like even even for kids or like um, people with which have a lot of infections, it's sometimes a really good way to to kind of improve the whole body health. Um, for example, I don't know from keto or from school when they just eat bullshit. And um, there's a re really good product, for example, in Germany where you 
it's some drops you give in the morning like half an hour before breakfast and then it kind of repairs um the the shell or like like she always said it's kind of a raw mm -hmm. um you kind of smoothen it and then yeah it's just uh, the gut stays healthy and then you can kind of feed it and with normal food with good normal food yeah, yeah. interesting um yeah okay if no one else has any thoughts on the paper or those pertaining questions i would love to hear what everyone has come up with in terms of my training question that i post into in, in the group um i want to know what tom is cooking <laughs> what is for dinner today it's uh it's like a fajita bowl Oh, wow, nice. I'm sure you've been looking forward to this all day since you're on very low calories. <laughs> See, oh, I can smell so. it. I knew it was Mexican-like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything that's like low calories and tasty, I'm all on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Melissa, you, you are not training at the moment, but nonetheless, do you, did you have anything? Yes, I'm training. I walk. Well, there you are. I am able to please. walk. Please share with us your three to five minute um, win or recognition from, from this week. So I can walk, no pain now. I can pick up the groceries, not all the way to the house, but I can pick uh, a bag of potatoes, like five kilos of potatoes. Yay. And um, yeah, I am struggling with my steps because I have, well, they have added some responsibilities to me that mean that now I have to sit in the computer for quite some hours during the day uh, so that I can see in my in my Fitbit that my steps have decreased a lot. But the steps that I do, they don't cause me pain. I can go upstairs to my office, which is in the seventh floor, and I can do that without pain. And I try not to use the elevator, which is what I can uh, access now. So that's what I've been training for this week. Okay. And next week, I have the physiotherapy appointment for three days. If what I have now is not a fever, because I'm having chills and my throat aches and my eyes are producing some material that shouldn't be producing, meaning pus. Okay. So I think I have a conjunctivitis. And if that is the case, then the appointment of the next week will have to be canceled because that's contagious. Well, um so recover. let's see and, yeah. maybe it doesn't happen maybe it's just who that is coming out of my eye because of yes <laughs> i am hopeful i still think that it might disappear um so yeah let's hope that it disappears and next week i can do physiotherapy and that would be something more interesting it sounds good well i'm glad you can walk pain free <laughs> Um, anyone else wants to share, share their learning experience or whatever from training from this week? Next. Um, I'll, I'll speak up. The only thing that has been on my radar, which I have not tried, and I'm not sure if anybody else is, is blood flow restriction. Oh, interesting. There hasn't been any reason for me to do that, although it's something that as trainers and someone in the gym, it's probably a good idea to try to explore once in a while, but it's not something I've done. Well, it's something maybe that might become relevant for Melissa in a few weeks when she starts back up with no weight, but just body weight things. Um, but yeah, I always hear it's such a great way to, to, to still el elicit some hypertrophy without any external load or minimal external load after an injury. Yeah, it that? would be... Blood Sorry, restriction works. So, for example, um, when we're talking about, or I guess Laura, you can explain since it's your your topic as well. <laughs> Don't want um, essentially, so it it initially they used a tourniquet in a certain part of your body. So, for example, if you had a knee injury, they would um, restrict the blood flow to your knee by wrapping a tourniquet around your leg and, and tightening it up enough. I, I from what I understand. The amount that you tighten it is very, very precise as well. You don't want it too much or too little. And then you would have a really low load 
and for like I'll take that knee for example and you do a leg extension so you essentially you want to restrict the blood flow but also still being able to activate without injury or um hurt, you know hurting the joint or not and if, if I'm incorrect with anything you guys please jump in because no, I, I would have described it similarly. I probably would have taken something like a bodyweight squat even as an example because you can easily do that like if you want to drive the hypertrophy in your in your thigh. So yeah, you would exactly you would it doesn't even have to be a tourniquet. I think nowadays it's you can even use um, you know, some of those rubber bands or whatever. Yeah. And you wrap it around so that it does it should feel really tight but obviously you should be able to get into that full range of motion it, it i i've tried it not in the proper training sense but just in like tying that around and trying to do that movement three four times and it's very uncomfortable but you do feel like straight yeah. away that the blood is sort of accumulating in that area um or like i guess being restricted from the other area and um, so it feels very interesting I would like to, I would like to find a way to be able to do it in my glutes, but I just don't know that that would, if you, if you yeah, can, no, that would be isolate difficult. That. <laughs> I think, I'm yeah. not, I think you can definitely like isolate your, your thigh, but your glute, well, I guess if you tie it up like yeah. very high up, 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 up the leg the thigh and then do some hip thrust or, or yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd probably, yeah. I'd probably do a hip, thrust. I don't just know. To say, with the blood flow restriction training, the idea is that you're stopping the venous return, but not the arterial inflow. Yeah, you're not going to stop the venous return in the, in the glutes. Right. No. <laughs> Unless you really tried. <laughs> Thank you. That's funny. Okay, well, that's good to know. Yeah. You can't do it with the glutes. <laughs> I was just going to add as well, from what I kind of last saw, I think sometimes they recommend pressures between 180 and 200 mils, uh, micrograms, I think. So sometimes you can get like a pressure gauge. I think they sometimes recommend like 180 to 200. But in my practical experience from using them, arms, that's too high. Legs, it's not high enough. Oh, um, but it, I think it depends from person to person. So, you know, if you had someone who didn't have very large thighs, then they probably wouldn't need to, you know, probably, you know, 180 or something might be fine. But for if you've got a male or someone who's got, you know, very large thighs, then, you know, you might need upwards of that for sure. Yeah, it's good. I would uh, where do you high. put them? So if you wanted, like, above the knee or no, like, it felt like your groin. Hip? In your groin. Oh, God. Okay, and for the arms, like yeah, just as high up as you can. Ouch. Okay, I'm gonna try that. <laughs> <laughs> you let us know how it goes. <laughs> I think like the typical protocol, like I, I think the typical protocol that they use is you do like an activation set of I think I think it's something like forty reps, and then you do like three sets after that of fifteen reps. I, I misunderstood think. the number for sure. You say forty. Yes. No. Mm -hmm. It's just body. Uh, I'm out. <laughs> no, no, mm. forty reps. I'll but no, I mean, that. if you do forty reps with an arm curl with no weight in your hand, that that makes sense. I think. Uh, okay, no weight. Okay, no. Yeah, yeah. But but I was thinking in a squat, like forty body weight squats. Yeah, but I guess start with just <laughs> extending your leg seated. That would probably be a safer way to to, and then forty is is can can be a lot too. <laughs> and they have done research into the again. Granted, it's the elderly untrained population, but I think it was a means of preventing sarcopenia. But they literally occluded old people's thighs and got them walking on a treadmill, and that improved their muscle mass. Mm. Well, Mike, would also work working in a treadmill. That I there could you do. Go. I can walk. <laughs> Mike, did you want to share your uh, week's um, tr training win or curiosity? I mm, I don't I don't know from a training perspective. I can't I can't think of any training revelations that's coming off the top of my head. To be honest with you. It's just been or, a good training week. Or anything you've you've heard or read about training that made you curious in the last week? 
If not, oh, you're gonna have to skip me out. You're gonna have to skip right, me. That's fine. Um, what about you, Tom? Uh, I'm in a bit of a similar position to be honest. I don't know. I don't know as I've got much <laughs> okay. wisdom going in this week. Um, it's all good. No, no worries. Not a month. Like days are really hard, but it feels good afterwards. <laughs> I mean, no, it, it doesn't have to be a relevation from your training. I just thought like we all listen to various podcasts or whatever, and um, there might be something Ooh. that someone mentioned about training, and you're like, oh, I should try this, like Laura's blood flow restriction, or um, I'm curious about rep range for that, or something like that. In which case, yes, I listen to Peter Atiyah's uh, recent recent podcast. I know he's some people don't like him. I like, I like, I like him. him. Um, I like him a lot. But uh, he talked about blood flow restriction training oh, in that podcast. Oh, there you seven go. nine. Yeah. And he I think he's got a protocol and he talks about how he does it and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, I don't remember it, but yeah, it did get me sort of interested. I was like, oh, you know, because <laughs> I don't know much about it. But, yeah. Okay. Cool. I think also, sorry, I know I'm harping on about the blood flow restriction training, but we also, I think they know that there's diminishing returns with it as well. So I think you use it for a period of time, like ideally six weeks, but then the potency of the stimulus that you get from it is probably going to diminish as the body adapts. So I think that's, there's an element to that as well, probably. That makes sense. What about, um, yeah, anybody else in regards to training? I've learned that I'm doing my lateral, lateral raises um, wrong ever since. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of one of a uh, a guy from the gym, like an older guy, he was like, "I have to. I see you every every week, like four times a week, and I have to tell you something. You're doing those wrong." You are, aren't you feeling pain in your shoulders? And I was like, yeah, actually, um, if I'm honest, yeah, it doesn't feel. And he's like, no, you have to, you have to reach this muscle like on the re like uh, like on the back of the arm. And I was like, ah, oh, yeah, how do you, what do you mean? And then he showed me, and yeah, actually, he's right. And I'm just, I did it wrong ever since. That that's awesome. Well, I'm glad that you figured something out, especially since you have or used to have a lot of issues with your neck. So that's good. Yeah, like it always re like this front and well, it's so dark. Uh, the front muscle. So yeah. this this one. Yeah. So yeah, I was always wondering like like why that was hurting, and now it actually goes to the right uh, stage or well, position. Awesome. <laughs> Very good win. And what about um, Joyce or Allison? <clears throat> um, well, the blood flow restriction thing has me thinking. It kind of freaks me out a little bit, if I'm being honest. <laughs> but um, So without making my story too long, uh, I do have a knee injury and um, have been trying to rehab that physical therapy that has not worked. Um, I had an x-ray and an MRI, and the news is not good. Um, I have a complex tear in my medial meniscus, meaning basically two tears in two different areas combined. Um, I have a, an MCL sprain um, and a uh, Baker's or cyst and <laughs> some thinning of the cartilage below my kneecap. So there's a lot going on in there. Um, and I'll be honest, I sort of had a meltdown when I got that <laughs> information and I sort of cried and my husband had to talk me down out of that state. But um, since then, I've been focusing on, okay, what can I do in the meantime, waiting to see the orthopedic surgeon. Um, so I can't go for walks anymore right now. Um, that seems to make it more inflamed and sore and stiff. And so I have been swimming laps, which has actually been really, really nice. Thankfully, it's not freezing here right now. Um, and I have been riding a stationary bike inside, which I loathe cardio equipment. I would rather run outside during a hurricane than run on a treadmill, but you got to do what you got to do. So indoor bicycling, um, swimming laps in the pool. And then um, I've been continuing to do my at home PT exercises with bands, doing some shallow squats. And then um, I do have access to a leg extension and leg curl machine. So I've been doing unilateral 
lightweight. I can't do heavy weight and I can't do a huge range of motion. So I'm increasing time under tension with those by using a lighter weight and just slowing down the eccentric movement as much as possible. Um, and just doing what I can until I see the orthopedic surgeon. I just got my referral today. So waiting for that appointment to see what's going to happen next, but it's a sad update, but I'm doing, I'm doing the best I can to like keep things strong and not allow things to, um, atrophy in the meantime. I I can, I feel for you because it's obviously going to be a longer procedure slash recovery slash whatever is coming up. Um, I think it's great that you're trying to do what you can do in the sense of swimming and cycling. And yeah, maybe you will be uh, trying some blood flow restriction work. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Maybe that'll be my new thing. <laughs> Yeah. You should definitely try it and um because and you should definitely keep going with the um unilateral training because have you heard of the crossbody effect, Alison? No, tell me more. So when you when you exercise the non-injured limb, there's a neurological crossover. So you're literally maintaining the strength in the injured limb, even though you're not directly exercising it. So the mere fact of you just still, you know, exercising your good leg that's still going to be helping the bad leg by maintaining the strength. So that's just absolutely perfect. Um, cool. And I think if you can, you know, even if there's small ranges, which you can exercise in that are kind of relatively pain-free and comfortable, then mm -hmm. definitely keep doing that for sure. And obviously the fitter and stronger that you are now, the, the more positive your outcomes are going to be later down the line. So yeah, just keep doing what you're doing for sure. Cool. Thank you. Alison, you could do blood flow restriction in the injured leg with very low weight or body weight, and the other leg you can train normally if if that makes a difference. Yeah, maybe I'll have to experiment with it and see how it goes. It does kind of freak me out a little bit, so I gotta read about it some more. I know it's super scary, but I do have the references from my class if you want, because Meno really likes it, so he has a list of references and. Uh, I support what the guy says. This was developed to train uh, injured people and in elderly people. So it is actually very safe. Okay, cool. Bryce, what about you? Any sh shares from, from your side? I don't really guess I have anything. I mean, I have done the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the blood flow um, that y'all were talking about. We did that a lot in CrossFit. I oh. was doing CrossFit. Yeah. Just with um, body weight things. Huh? Just with body weight then or for what exercises? Well, I I don't remember. I, I kind of, we would just do it like we had an injury or something and we would actually wrap, wrap that area and then we would walk on it or squat or whatever to kind of get the blood flow and everything going there. And it, I, I had trouble with my knee at one time and I, I did that quite a bit, and I, but I felt like it helped. I don't have any problems anymore, but um, it's been a long time since I've done it. But we used to do that quite a bit, the coaches and all of us. If we had an injury or whatever, some people would just do it just to be doing it or whatever. But but yeah, but um, other than that, I don't can't think of any. That's fine. No uh, problem. <laughs> other than <laughs> all good. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, I'll be sending out the article for next week, which will be from the Ellen Aragon Research Review. I think it's shorter, again, also. Um, but yeah, we can talk about it then. So thank you, everybody, for your time. And I hope you all have a nice evening or afternoon. Enjoy the burrito. <laughs> well, yes, Tom, too. <laughs> Bye.